Hi, this is Ryan. I'm one of the co-hosts for the Compass Podcast. Back in 2013, I had to take a graduate-level church history course. And I know that's not thrilling sounding to a lot of folks, but this course was a little bit different. We didn't have a lot of long-winded lectures. Instead, we got to do things like stage epic rap battles between famous theologians in history. We traded around theologian trading cards. We talked about history's changing perceptions of Jesus through the lens of Jesus' hipster jokes. Like, have you heard this one? Why did Jesus walk on water? Because walking on land was too mainstream. Our ringleader for all of this was Dr. Kate Bowler. She was the professor for the course, and she brought, well, a ton of knowledge to the class, of course, but she also brought passion for the subject and a passion for life, which was evident in well, the way she conducted herself and the energy that she brought through the jokes that she told and for the ways that well, she showed concern for those of us in the class. So it was tremendously sad for us when we learned a short time after our class ended that that Kate had been diagnosed with stage 4 cancer. In fact, at the time of her diagnosis, Kate had just been given a couple months to live. Now we can fast forward that to the present a couple years later, and through a lot of outstanding care, through a ton of personal perseverance, Kate is still with us. She's working just as hard as ever. She's pursuing life with the same passion Uh, Well, probably even more so than she represented to us in the class. She's teaching, and and now she's writing quite a bit, too. You can find her work in the New York Times. You can also find her work in a couple of books, the, the most recent of which is going to be inspiring for a ton of people. It's called Everything Happens for a Reason and Other Lies that I've Loved. And it's given us cause, Pierce and I cause, to to have a conversation with Kate about how this diagnosis has changed her perception on life, her perspectives on faith, and where the divine is fitting in to all of this. Well, Kate Bowler is with us. She's a mom, a wife. She's a professor of religious history at Duke University. She's the author of Blessed, which is a history of America's prosperity gospel. That's this this belief that if you have enough faith, then health and wealth and happiness are going to follow along in line. She's also a Canadian. She brags about that quite regularly. So I feel like, Kate, that's fair to say that's a part do, of, yeah. of your identity. Also, back in 2013, you uh, you taught a an upstart young pastor in training named Ryan, uh, as memorable as I'm sure that was. Um, uh, anything noteworthy happy since happened since then? Oh, for me? <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Whoa. Uh, well, yes, uh, my life is a lifetime movie, um, but uh, about a plucky upstart young professor who, <laughs> uh, who started living her research. Yeah. So as you mentioned, I am an expert in the prosperity gospel. And when you're an expert at like 35, it means that you started too young. Like <laughs> it was it got too weird too fast. So when I was maybe 23, I started already getting excited about this message of health and wealth and what it meant. And so, yeah, I studied that for about 10 years and wrote that history called Blessed. And then in the last two years, I got really, really sick and had to kind of grapple with the implications of what it means to be facing death in a culture that says that everything happens for a reason. Hmm. So Kate, what was that? What was that first remembrance, that first time you felt like you encountered that prosperity gospel, that that thought process? Where were you? Was it in a room? Was it on TV? Was it on the radio? And then and then also, I'd love to know, like, where were you in life at that moment? Yeah. That, that well, connected I, with you? I was um, on our only freeway in Winnipeg, this super, super <laughs> crappy. I honestly, I love my hometown so much, and it has the worst roads. So we only have one road that goes fast. And the perimeter goes around the whole thing. And they put up a stoplight and I almost <laughs> lost my mind. And I was like, guys, give this to me. And so I was sitting at the stoplight and I was watching all these people file out of what I assumed was a warehouse. Hmm. And then I looked over and realized, um, oh, no, this is a church. And and I thought my first thought was, no, uh, we don't make churches that look like warehouses. We are we are Canadians. <laughs> is not us. There's no um, steeple on it. Is that what you're saying? 
Uh, just it has that sort of lovely industrial chic. And you know how, like, in the inside of mega churches, it all looks like it's the set of the musical Rent? You know? <laughs> oh, like, that's good. It's scaffolding and um, just uh, a lot of song, a lot of lingering song. <laughs> um, and so I heard that there's this huge church on the outside of town. And so I asked around about it and heard that there was a really slick pastor who celebrated holidays like Pastor's Appreciation Day and that he had gotten the gift of a motorcycle and that he'd ridden it around on stage. And I almost lost my mind because I thought, one, this can't be us. This is for Americans. (laughs) Two, how is it that so many of my Mennonite friends are going there? Mm -hmm. Mennonites who are historically committed to pacifism and simplicity and ruining everything with Jello, and uh, and I thought like this this is not the kind of simple faith that I was raised in and that I've come to know. So it sort of started started with that more car accident feeling you get when you notice something new and you think, mm. uh, and then gradually became uh, an intellectual interest, and then something I felt I mean pretty much deep empathy, almost defensiveness towards. For its um, for its ability to keep its finger on the pulse of something, I thought most people were too quick to ignore. So, were you before that time frame, childhood, uh, churched, unchurched? Yeah, very Jesusy. Um, okay. my, parents, my parents both became Christians a little bit later in life, which meant that I skipped a lot of the um, full on indoctrination of an evangelical youth. Mm-hmm. I was probably 16 before I realized there was a man out there somewhere named James Dobson, and he probably didn't want me to be a pastor, even though I didn't imagine being a pastor. I just knew he didn't want me to be. And, uh, and so it was a kind of later, a later uh, inculcation into evangelicalism, but it was mostly Mennonite churches, gotcha. um, which were just lovely, cheese-eating pacifists. <laughs> so it, now as time has worn on you have written another book everything happens for a reason and other lies i've loved um where did that come from why'd you write this book when i got sick i i was sort of horrified to realize that there were aspects of the prosperity gospel something i thought i had studied only intellectually that that i started worrying that maybe i believed all along So like, for instance, when you get that sick, so I, I go from just being a regular person with no cancer in my family to suddenly getting a stage four cancer diagnosis Mm -hmm. at 35. Mm -hmm. It was, it was, it was just like a bomb. It like, it felt like it was, it was just utter devastation. And in the midst of that, I had I mean, I think all the natural feelings of shock and, you know, fear and horror and, but then I just started wondering, like, what did I really hope for? Like, what did I really expect? Hmm. And did I really think that maybe this was all going to work out? Uh, And were these, were these theological beliefs? Like, were these, you know, like, you're trying to figure out why you're so angry at God. And then you have to wonder, like, did I really think that you promised me this all along? So I wrote the book sort of as a kind of painful, hopeful, theological excavation project where I just tried to dig into the hardest things about who I am. Like, did I, did I think that I was special? Did I think that I was the exception to the rule that bad things just happen to people? Mm -hmm. And it's, it was, um, it gave me, I think, renewed compassion for the people that I've studied for so long who want, I think, really s- average things from God. Like, I think we imagine the health and wealth gospel as like everybody wants a Mercedes. But like, I think people really mostly want the things that keep our lives together. They want, you know, kids that don't despise them and clothes that look OK on them and enough money in the bank to feel comfortable and just that feeling like your life is moving forward, Mm -hmm. you know? And then when you have to imagine that your life isn't going anywhere, like, because it might end, it is, it is bracing. (laughs) Let me show you. And it really, it really caused me to wonder and to question and just to try to get real about what Christian hope really looks like. Hmm. I think we probably need to un- unpack a-, a little bit what your diagnosis is that 
Uh, at the age of 35, you were diagnosed with stage four cancer. And well, what does that look like for you now? Well, it's been two years of treatment, which is not fun. It mostly just means that your life is usually in the hospital and it doesn't seem weird when people are wearing face masks when they're talking to you. And you're really good at small talk while people are taking out needles that are seem like they're for horses, but they're for people. And you sort of develop this pattern of life around the normal world that everybody else lives in and then hospital world. So I started hospital world about almost not quite two and a half years ago, maybe like a little over two years ago. Yeah. And so it's the liturgy of scans and blood work and, um, and standing in line for a very expensive copay. Hmm. So that, that takes up most of my life. <laughs> so I want to go back to that kind of core belief of you need to have faith. And the way that you show you have faith is is through your giving, your tithing, right? And, yeah. And, and it goes deeper than that, obviously. Um, and so somebody that was, for you, that was in that world to some degree, that you talked about, you studied it, and now on this side of it, where do you see faith really being played out? And how does it really be played out? And and mm-hmm. versus how it's been abused? Well, I think... Um... I think the prosperity gospel is confused because it's gotten con- it's 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 blurred the distinction between hope and certainty. Mm. It is at its heart a theodicy, right? An explanation for the problem of evil in the world. Mm. And it looks at the have-nots and it says like God has provided a solution through giving, through prayer, through intentional um spiritual hustle. Like you really can have what God has promised you. And the beauty in that is that it expects God to show up in the details of your life. Mm -hmm. I I found that to be really inspirational. When I would go to church on Sunday with them, um, they were really expecting God to do something that week. I thought that was a kind of lovely anticipation that is often missing in other churches. But the saddest part, of course, is that immediately then tragedy becomes a burden on those who can't get it together. And it forgets, it's like it forgets what it's like to stand on the side of the losers like me, like the untrodden. And I mean, that's partly why I'm really excited my book is coming out at Lent, because Lent is the time when the church is supposed to be on my side, Mm. not the side of the winners, not the side of like the Easter faith and the he is risen indeed. It's the marching toward death facing down the darkness, standing on this side of the abyss and saying, like, what could ever paper over the difference? Mm. I think we have to practice being Lenten people. And the problem, I think, fundamentally, is that the prosperity gospel is is out of practice. Mm. Your book, it expresses a kind of a dissatisfaction with extremes. Like, when you're <laughs> diagnosed and, yeah. and you kind of make this this announcement to the public, um, yep. you get a lot of people sharing a lot of different things with you. And <laughs> yeah. on, on one hand, there, there are like the atheists who write to you to say you should probably just give up the search for religious meaning. Yeah. And, and then on the other hand, and this is not a, a bandwagon that you're really to, willing to jump on either, there are people who yeah. are writing that are saying, there's a plan for this, right? This is, yeah. this is God's will. This happened for a reason. Every reformed dude out there is... <laughs> convinced there's a lesson I haven't learned. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. And it's still coming. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> your experience isn't really, it, it's not really driven by divine design, but it's not devoid of like sure. divine presence either. So no, I think that's right. Like, I mean, cause here's, here was the great surprise for me about being sick is that, and I really mean this as a legitimate surprise but God was there anyway. And like, it gets me so emotional just like saying that to you right now. Cause it's like, it was, you know, I'm a pretty cerebral person and I like categories and now I'm experiencing a world that's sort of despair beyond categories. And I was genuinely surprised that in the worst of my hospital moments, I could actually feel God's presence. And like, let me tell you how grateful I am. <laughs> grateful that I don't have to, to invent God. Yeah. 
Mm. I didn't have to, and I didn't have to pray a special prayer, and I didn't have to have a special faith because I was unconscious most of the time. <laughs> I mean, God is was just there, and like that, I think is is the deep hope of grace that, that like that God will make up the difference just because of who God is, and. I love that that takes me to a place beyond formulas and beyond because I didn't deserve it. You know, I didn't do anything to get it. And there's really no like special formula for getting it back either. You know what I mean? Like when you're walking or like you're just having a moment and you can sort of actually suddenly realize that God is there. And then there's the rest of the day where it just feels annoying and the person beside you is coughing and like, you know, you hate your neighbor. And, you know, then there's just the rest of ordinary time. And so the great surprise is learning to live without being able to conjure up all the feelings and the proof and just to live with the hope and that that in the worst of it, there is something beyond ourselves that's like determined to pursue us. What were some of the specific moments that made you aware that God was there? A lot of it was just people like, <laughs> this is so stupid, but when I first came to Duke, I was really, <laughs> this is, this is going to sound really ungrateful. I really bummed out that I had gotten my dream job so early and that I'd have to live here for the rest of my life and probably die in my office. It's so lame, but like I achieved my dreams. I was so happy. Thank you, Duke. Got my job. And then I had all these lingering fears about dying in my office someday, like lonely and sad. Um, and, uh, and I read, I was a part of this book group and, uh, it was about this other guy, uh, Reynolds Price who'd gotten sick, mm-hmm. uh, Duke. And that he, when he was rushed to the hospital, the guy who he shared a printer with, like took him to the hospital. And I remember like ruining this poor book group of mostly strangers being like, how depressing, <laughs> like you're stuck with the people you share a printer with. Um, <laughs> and then of course I, I get sick and my family can't be here in time. Like nobody can get here in time. Cause it's such an emergency and guess who's there at the hospital. Well, it's everyone I share a printer with. And like every beautiful person I was just in a faculty meeting with or down the hall is showing up to anoint my head with oil or like get me socks or, you know, make sure the temperature of the room is great. Like it was the most intense feeling of like feeling ministered to with the hands and feet and face of Jesus, it was so, I was so blown away by how ungrateful I had been by the possibility of this and then just how grateful I was when it came true. So in those, in those moments for those that are listening and, and, um, and as part of my story as well, walking away from the faith and coming back to it, uh, what do you say to the person that just goes, man, you were just surrounded by good people. God really wasn't there. Mm -hmm. Like you just, you had caring people around you that loved you and and was there for you in that moment um how do you how do you differentiate that in that moment um to know that there, there's more than just um yeah, good, good people feeling. there yeah the sort of day to day stuff was the good people but the divine presence stuff was something more and it was something actually i was so uncomfortable talking about that i just sort of kept it to myself <laughs> cuz i didn't i because it, you get to the part where it's very hard to explain or rationalize. Yeah. Um, mostly because um, I think maybe as growing up in evangelicalism, you feel like everything that's true, you should be able to put in a pamphlet. Mm. <laughs> the presence of God to me feels like overwhelming love. Mm. And sometimes it comes through people, but so much of it was just lying by myself, listening to the beep of hospital machines pretty sure because they told me that I was going to die that year and not feeling angry because all I could feel was love. Yeah. I think for when I was in that part of my journey and then even, you know, today having friends that, that would, would put themselves in a classification of atheism or agnostic, you know, um, that whole idea of God's presence and knowing God's there, uh, like, for those people that do have faith, it kind of freaks us out too. Oh, I mean, honestly, you know? 
<laughs> I think I think really in retrospect, I don't think I'd really felt it before. Yeah. I mean, like I think I'd had worship experiences I'd enjoyed. I felt I, I sort of experienced the truth of uh, what I see as the gospel. You know, I was like very convinced, mm-hmm. but that's mm-hmm. n- but like was I shocked by the presence of God? No, <laughs> I mean probably not. <laughs> not really. <laughs> not until then. Yeah. And like it was to the point where I went around asking all my theologian friends like is this normal? Will this stay? Like I had a lot of questions because I was, I was genuinely surprised, Yeah. but luckily I work with mostly theologians. So they <laughs> like took the book off the shelf and were like, look, who <laughs> said it best, <laughs> which honestly was really helpful. Cause you feel like, um, you, you want to, I mean, it's like anybody when they like have a weird thing on their toe, they're like, is this normal? And then they Google it. That's sort of my theological experience where I want always going is this normal and then everyone duke, kind of your duke colleagues are your your are your spiritual web md yeah, they, <laughs> i i really that is exactly right in the midst of finding god in these moments um and, and being a person who's well academic and you have a, a broad understanding of what religion is um yeah. why hold to a, a christian world view like like what is it about christianity that that paints a a different light uh, or a different color onto this? In my story, everything comes apart. Mm -hmm. And I find in the story of Jesus, a guy who gets nailed to the cross and then he just hangs there. Like his humiliation, his the inability for it to be a shiny story hmm. is so moving to me because I mean, there's, I just imagine like we, there's all these books that actually I have in this bookshelf beside me called like Jesus CEO, right? As yeah. if like yeah. this one that we imagine, if we imagine Jesus as the like pastorpreneur, like he knew how to have an efficient day. He knew how to maximize his time. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> all kinds of, uh, you know, inspirational, tweetable things to share. And, uh, and like, I picture the person I was trying to become and then someone who didn't waste a minute and was always moving forward. And then I look at the example of Jesus and like, it was that, that really stayed with me when I was facing the exhaustion of a life that wasn't going to come together. And I find in the Lenten church all kinds of beauty that in the cracks, the presence of God fills it and lets something grow. And the sheer impossibility of that, I think, will always allow me to see Jesus as like the full expression of hope in the crushing darkness. Yeah, I think that's a great line, seeing Jesus in the crushing darkness because sometimes that crushing darkness is is your situation right it's a it's a it's a diagnosis um, it's an uncertainty of of what's next and when is the next happening yeah and then it's also that moment of going to a job every day and that same person making that same comment that's eating you away and you yeah. just can't get past it and so it comes in in all different forms for all different people um but within that context of that darkness, there is a hope and there is a light. And for people of faith, it's even for us, like we've been talking about, it, it, it's, it can surprise us and shock us in the moments. But I love what you said. Yeah. One of the things that you took away from, from the prosperity church and faith is, is that they came in with some expectancy of, it of, did. Of, of seeing God move of being active in our life. And that's the thing I think that most churches and most Christians across the theological spectrum probably lack, you know, is that expectancy that, that we serve a God and and, and we we're in love with a God who is active. I heard, I heard preach the other day, the sermon out of Acts one, right? Where Jesus his last moments with his disciples right before they go. And and he tells them all these things and, and he says, I want you to go here and do this. And he, like final instructions before he leaves and, and and he tells them to wait right for the Holy yeah. Spirit to come and so it's that moment of him going you have you have my words you have my directions you don't have my spirit yet so wait 
And so I've heard that sermon preached. I'm a pastor's kid, right? So I've heard that all the time. And so I was hearing it preached and I was like, yes, this is a good sermon. This is good stuff. And then the guy flipped it and he said, if you go back, and I had not done this yet, he goes, if you go back to the original language, the word wait, we've kind of translated it wrong. It actually means to expect. There's an expectancy there. Mm. To wait with expectancy. It's such a beautiful thing for us. And that is throughout your book and throughout your story of going like, I'm, I'm waiting on God because I know God is there and I will see him in that crushing darkness. Yeah, I think it's so hard to wait. Like, mm. because, I mean, we're we're incomplete and everything comes apart all the time. Yeah. Right. So like you reconcile with someone and then that friendship comes undone. Mm-hmm. You have hopes for your kid and then there's a setback at school. Like there's a million ways where we're trying to put a bow on things. I think just because we're always seeking endings so much, I think of having to live the Christian life is is to learn. I think you're right to wait with expectancy and just know, though, in the midst of it, you are inherently not a problem to be solved yes. just because you're in pain. Yeah. You know, yep. I heard. We, we're in pain because we are the kingdom of God is not yet here. Period. Yes. It's good. And like it, there will be enough. Like that's the prosperity gospel we can believe in. God will give us enough. But what enough means will not be very easy to see with the naked eye. Mm. I love the little since I'm a millennial, I love the little tweetable statement that says, you're not a project, but you're in process. Mm -hmm. And uh, something I've held on to for a while. Oh, no. Everyone wants you to be a project, though. They want lists. Uh, Yes. Listicles. Yeah, no. If one more person tries to fix me, I will do something that requires them to be (laughs) needing a little assistance sometime soon. I'm getting close to just threats and... (laughs) (laughs) So we're going to let you vent for a moment then. So the appendices of your book, which, by the way, is is a fantastic book. And I'm going to realistically recommend this for everybody that's listening. Um, No matter what stage Mm -hmm. of life that you're in, everything happens for a reason is is a wonderful read. Um, And well, full of of a lot of profundity or profound (laughs) thoughts and statements. Um, For me, I found that the appendices uh, like really profound. Yeah, I wish that they taught seminary (laughs) classes just on on that kind of stuff. And in in fact, if you want to like make a poster, people would would probably purchase that. So Mm -hmm. when we're having those moments, uh, we know not to say like, well, you know, at least you have blank or oh yeah yeah yeah. there's a lot of so this is this is the part that moves me to threats lately is um (laughs) okay it's like two things one is i wrote two popular pieces like and the first one the point of the piece was um please don't pour certainty on my pain Hmm. period that was it like hey the world is hard please don't try to force me to say that everything's happening for a reason And then what did thousands of people do? (laughs) He wrote me letters to tell me why everything happens for a reason. And I was like, guys, you're killing me here. And then the second popular piece was like, hey, try not to minimize other people's situations. And just like, don't treat them like problems to be solved. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, I immediately get email. It's like, look, (laughs) I looked it up, and you're not in the hospital right now. <laughs> so it's really that bad. Yeah. yeah, exactly. There are so many ways I think people forget that their presence really matters to someone like me. Like, there's a thousand things to do that don't require them to have perfect things to say. Like, I, I have found that I'm usually not looking for reasons or explanations or or the right words. I'm just looking for someone to show up and to let me be a human, whatever that means that day. So I love um, presence. I am not above receiving gifts of all kinds. And it's so much better if they're not cancer thematically appropriate. Like. <laughs> You know, like I, I, I just I like stupid erasers or like a potted plant. Like people just love it when you remember them, and they love it when you find a way to compliment them without seeming like um, they're talking about you in the past tense. Mm-hmm. And they just want to know that you recognize them where they are, but you're not asking something. 
Mm-hmm. So all you can just say is like, man, I'm so sorry. It's been such a tough year. And then pivot or describe that you want to be there. Like my, my friend says, like, when in doubt, describe. You say, you know, I'm, I'm so glad to see you and I've been worried about being a bad friend and I don't want to say the wrong thing. I just want you to know that I love you. Done. Right. Like chasm overcome. <laughs> you have solved the world. So there's, there's so many ways to be present, I think, without being trite and, um, and trying to offer someone an explanation for what's happening to them. In the book, there, there's a line that I, I can't quite get over. Uh, I think it's because it speaks to me uh, so deeply. It's this line that, where you said, I, I failed to love what was present and decided to love what was possible instead. And, mm-hmm. and now I must learn to live in ordinary time, but I don't know how. And you're speaking to uh, this idea that you'd always kind of been in love with things that were going to happen in the future, uh, mm-hmm. you know, working towards your, your career and, and, and building a family. And, and now you, you're learning to, well, to be present in, in the day. What have you figured out now about living in ordinary times? <laughs> I'm so, I am the worst. I think that book is like, I love, <laughs> I just noticed rereading parts. I'm like, I have learned nothing. <laughs> <laughs> but I do try to do this one thing where I, I try to notice like a peak moment in the day. Cause like, cause it could happen at any time. Like this morning, uh, my kid crawled into bed beside me and he passes me a stuffed animal that he brought me from downstairs. And then there was just such like a sweet little snuggle. And I thought like, what if this is the best part of my day? Like just stay there, you know? And so I try to learn to stretch out the time a little more and not to always be imagining that like the day is something I'm supposed to conquer, but something that will come to me that I need to be much more aware of the, of the moments I'm living in and not just the time passing. In those moments that you're looking at, what are some moments that you look back and you wish you could have stretched out a little longer? I don't know. Do you, do you notice that some people's brains work backwards? Like they're able to I- isolate regrets. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And some people like, get <laughs> some mired. Some are just backwards thinkers. Man. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I think, yeah. I, well, I think I only think forwards. Hmm. So my, like, I find I'm able to, like, forgive other people very quickly, for instance, because I don't think backwards very much. Oh, right. That's um, a great quality. Yeah. Well, I, I did feel like I think I was just wired that way. Most of my sins are forward thinking sins, <laughs> ones in which I, in which I, like, gobble up time because I'm living in a future that does not yet exist. Hmm. You've talked about um, the awareness of Lent, and uh, we're moving into this season of Lent. Uh, yeah. Is- what does Dr. Kate plan on giving up for Lent? Oh, man. Ooh, ah, uh, okay. Um, well, <laughs> as someone who went to Catholic school, the answer is always, of course, chocolate. Chocolate, yeah. Or, the or, um, yeah, or <laughs> the great, exactly. We should do, definitely do a thing about the great evils of Lent. But like cho- <laughs> chocolate mild gossip about a shared enemy. Um, <laughs> I... Well, because last year I gave up like video games that were taking up that were just like numbing me out, uh, which is so dumb. But I needed to like actually learn to sit with discomfort. Um, yeah, no, <laughs> wait, hold on now. Hold on. We got it. We had a pause battling. on this. We yeah. had a pause. What's your video games? <laughs> well, that's the yeah, question. I, I love um, uh, I love turn based strategy games, you know, like Civilization oh, and those. Yeah. Yes. Because they're so great. I mean, I, I've yeah. heard that's cool. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my gosh. Yeah, it's so fun. I couldn't play stuff like Age of Empires because when, like, things in which, like, there's no separation of time and all of a sudden you'd be like, do-do, do-do, and, like, people are attacking you. Right, it's continuous movement. <laughs> exactly. So I'm trying to, I don't know, I think for Lent, I... I don't know what it is, but it would have to have the certain these certain qualities. One, it would have to learn, teach me how to be a little bit more present. It would have to not be something that like diminishes the quality of day. Do you know what I mean? So that I don't actually enjoy other people. Mm. I feel like that's always people's um like self flagellation time. Where they're like this is the worst. <laughs> and I'm like, no, my life is already the worst. I need my small comforts. Mm. Um, and third, I think maybe it would be something that allows me to think more about service. 
Because I think sometimes when you're in the middle of the tragedy, you forget. It, it can be really hard to remember the pain of others consistently. Mm-hmm. So, I don't know. Something that forces me out of my own head and into somebody else's problems. Whatever that is, I want to do that. <laughs> Sounds like Instagram's getting deleted. <laughs> <laughs> no. well, how do you know what other people are doing then, Pierce? If you're not... <laughs> you have to be present with them. That's right. You have to be present. Oh. <laughs> Well, you are undertaking something new. You're going to start a podcast of your own. What can we look forward to in that? Ooh, well, um, I've got this podcast called Everything Happens. And then for a reason is scratched out because I wanted to talk to other people who have, I think, had to relearn their life after the worst thing happened. Mm. And I think... I'd like to thicken up the language around um, being grateful, even after tragedies of all kinds, without having to say trite things like that God is redeeming the situation. Hmm. But like, we really can learn things in the dark. So what are they? So I'm interviewing um, uh, people like Nadia Bowles-Weber about what she learned about being a pastor through alcoholism, um, Hmm. talking to my friend Ray Barfield, who had to learn how to be a pediatric oncologist who lets little kids break his heart. Um, Talking to, um, let's see, uh, Lucy Kalanithi, who's uh, the wife of the man who wrote When Breath Becomes Air, um, about uh, his own uh, fears of his passing and what she learned about loving no matter what. So yeah, I'm talking to some really brave people, and I'm I'm really hoping to learn some things. On that, really quick before we before we close, I was reading this book yesterday or last few days on Gen Z. So this is this generation 1999 and above. They're very different than millennials, a lot of things. But one of the staggering statistics from this Barna Group study came out that said, um, kind of asked what was the what did they want to do by the time they were 30, right? So what are your priorities by the time you're 30? And only, I think it was two out of 10, maybe three out of 10 said they want to know who they really are, Huh. which, which kind of broke, I mean, not kind of, it, it broke my heart reading that, um, huh. that it was, that, that that's being put off so far by this next generation. And so one of the things I just heard you talk about in that was, you know, so often we wait till the moment of despair or we wait till the sure. moment of tragedy to find out who we are. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, yeah. And so in that, for that person that's listening, you know, they're in high school right now, they're getting ready to head to college, or maybe it, it could be somebody else. What's an encouraging word that you can give them for, they don't have to wait for the tragedy to find out who they are? Well, yeah. And like, I think I always thought that my job at that stage was always to just get somewhere else. Yeah. Like, I mean, I, I look at my like 17 year old self and I think, oh my gosh, she was so afraid that like she was not going to be able to piece things together and like get into that school and f- get into that program and get those grades and like always thinking forward. Yeah. And I'm grateful for all the habits and whatever it takes to get things done. But like the problem is you can learn so much of yourself if you're not trying to skip to the end. I mean, the great mystery of anybody, right, is that they're a discovery and they're not usually the stories that other people have told them. And like, we all have to like dig in and figure out who that person is. And it's, 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 we are usually a surprise to ourselves. <laughs> yeah. but, but I'm grateful that when I dig, I, when like, when I did take a minute that I had more than I thought I had, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. that like what I had already was enough. Yeah. And maybe I could be a little less panicked about the future if I could just linger a little more in the present. So, Kate, thank you so much for joining us on, on this episode. Uh, the book is available February 7th. Everything happens for a reason and other lies I've loved. And um, when does the, the podcast formally launch? Oh, yeah. The first three episodes are the day of book release. So Awesome. Fe- All right. Yeah, you- thanks so much for having me. This was so fun. On behalf of Pierce, I want to thank all of you for listening to us through this podcast. You can find more at RethinkChurch.org. Big thanks to Lane Denson for being our producer, engineer, and troubleshooter extraordinaire. And hey, check us out on iTunes and and give us uh, a few stars and share some thoughts or comments, especially about what has inspired you through this episode. We would love to hear from you.